Erst Maximilian Olset, I'm Johannes Krupp from CISPA, the Helmholtz Center for Information Security in Saarbrücken. Um, I'm a final year PhD student there, and today I'm talking a little bit about our work on DDoS attacks, um, DDoS tracebacks in particular, and most importantly about DDoS traceback using BGP poisoning, which we published a paper on just recently. Um, so just a quick recap, I guess you're mostly familiar with this, but the type of DDoS that we're interested in is the so-called reflective DDoS attack. Um, and for this, well, of course, we have a attacker on the left side and then the victim on the right side. And what the attacker will do is he will pick some UDP-based services on the open internet and send them some requests, but not normal requests, but he will just spoof the source address. So from the perspective of these services, it looks as if they get a request from the victim. And since they're UDP-based and UDP doesn't really have the concept of a handshake or anything like that, they will just happily reply and flood in with some stuff. And one common example for this is uh, DNS. For example, if you query a DNS server for the domain cpsc.gov and ask for a any query type, um, you're basically sending a 37-byte data packet for the DNS server, but then the server will send you back to a max record, an A record, a quad A record, a text record, four keys, a NSEC3 param, and nine signatures, and some more stuff. So basically, for the 37 bytes that you send towards the server, you get in return 4,071 4, bytes. So you get an effective bandwidth amplification of roughly 110. An even worse example is NTP. So NTP has this monitoring command called monlist, which is just an 8-byte packet. And what this queries the server is basically, dear server, please tell me all the IP addresses that you had had contact with in the last 24 hours, roughly. And then the server will send a packet for a bunch of IP addresses. But it will not just send you one packet, it will actually send you up to 100 of those packets. So for eight bytes input, you get 44,000 bytes output, which is, um, gives an amplification factor of over 5,000. And the bad thing about this NTP um, attack, basically, is that this, although it's just a monitoring command used for, for debugging, basically, it was enabled by default in many, many old versions. Um, it has been disabled since, but there are still many, many servers out there that run the old config. Um, and then these attacks basically lead to headlines like DDoS attacks with 300 gigabits of traffic, uh, 400 gigabits of traffic, 500 gigabits. Um, and then three years ago, we had like the biggest ever DDoS attack that reached 1.35 terabits. So these amplification attacks are very, very powerful attacks. Um, and one of the first questions that we, of course, had is, can we study these beyond looking for headlines? Like, can we do anything else than just wait for headlines? Um, and the idea that we came up with was to install a honeypot. Um, so if you look at this type of attack, basically our honeypot tries to mimic one of these servers in the middle that is used as an amplifier in an attack. Um, and the honeypot, which we call mpot, is a very simple honeypot, basically. Whenever it receives a request, it has what we call the packet handler that will just lock some basic information and store this in the database, including like what IP does the packet come from, which port is it sent to, what's the current time. And then we have a bunch of protocol handlers that basically try to generate a convincing enough response that a scanner that's looking for amplification will accept us as a potential amplifier. Um, in some cases, for example, to answer DNS queries, we will just answer a query at some upstream DNS server and then cache the result. But in other cases, for example, for NTP, we can just send like a pre-recorded response. Um, and then, of course, since we don't actually want to contribute to the attack, we have some very, very strict rate limiting in place. That basically means as soon as we have sent 10 packets per minute to a slash 24 network, we will stop replying at all. Um, 
At the bottom, I have like a small excer excerpt of the protocols that we're currently supporting, starting from like legacy protocols like the quote of the day protocol and the character generator protocol, which is basically send some UDP packet and get back a bunch of random characters um, from the really, really old days of the internet um, up to, I don't know, protocols that should not really exist on the open internet, like the service discovery protocol, SSDP. Uh, but newer protocols, like for example, memcached, which is a very, very recent introduction, also had an amplification attack. Now, traffic that we see at the honeypot roughly falls into three categories. We have scans, which are people looking for amplifiers, and potential amplifiers that they can use in subsequent attacks. We have actual attack traffic, and then, as with every system on the internet, we have some some backscatters, some some random stuff that just gets to your system. And of course, we are only interested in looking at attacks. And the filter that we came up with, which we think is a very conservative filter, is basically we consider something an event only an attack if we have more than 100 trackets per victim and protocol in less than one hour. Now, our current deployment of, of MPOT encompasses around 60 Honeypot IP addresses, um, mostly located with some cloud providers, so that we can have a good geographic distribution. We also have some, some machines from, from other research institutes. Um, just a brief look at like the data that we're seeing. So this is the last year of text. And we can see roughly 15,000 attacks per day. There are some 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 peaks and some some valleys. Um, I don't really know exactly like what these are corresponding to in last year. So for example, there is like a, a slight downward slope just after the U.S. election. Might be coincidence. Um, but yeah, that's basically fifteen thousand attacks per day on average is what we see. Um, we can split this down by by protocols, and we see that currently there are five dominating protocols. Um, SSTP, the Service Discovery Protocol, NTP, the Network Time Protocol, ELDA, which was a recent addition in the last few years. Um, then there are still some DNS, and Charger is also still used, although it's, it's getting less and less, thankfully. We can put also in relative sizes, and then we see that basically half of all the texts roughly are NTP and ELDA. But of course, the other protocols also contribute their, their share. Now, looking at the victim IPs of the attacks, we see that actually most victims are attacked only once. So over 60% of all victim IPs are attacked only once, and less than 1% are attacked more than 10, 10 times. However, if we're looking at the networks that these IPs are located in, we see that actually over half of all these slash 16 networks are attacked more than, than 16, 16 times. So individual IPs are attacked rarely, but the network states are located in see lots and lots of attacks. Another interesting plot we can make is on the duration of attacks. And so here basically you see the, the CDF over all the attack durations. And what's this is that 90% of all the texts are actually shorter than, than one hour. Um, even more pronounced, 80% of all the texts are shorter than 15 minutes. And what you can see in this plot really nicely is that there are certain steps at like the one minute mark, the two minute mark, there's a big set at the five minute mark. Um, and all this just hints at the fact that these attacks are highly automated. Like these are rarely script kitties that are just running some, some bash script by hand. But in many, many cases, we're talking about attacks launched by booter services or some other infrastructures that have really commoditized these types of attacks. And then the last plot I want to show you is the location of our victims. Um, where basically we've taken a, a Hilbert curve to plot the entire IP space into a, a square. And then every pixel corresponds to a slash 16 network, and the brighter a pixel is, the more attack it sees. And what's really prominent in this picture is basically that 
their internet. And the only really black squares that you can see are, well, the reserved uh, prefixes, like 127 is black, 10 is black, and the, the upper right corner where like the, all the reserved IP blocks are. Um, and in the lower IP ranges, only the blocks belonging to the Department of Defense are not attacked that much. And of course, then the next question is, what can we do about this? What can we do about all these attacks? Because obviously, this is not a situation that we want to have. And potential countermeasures basically fall into two classes. There's the class of prevention, which basically means, OK, we need to contact people that run servers that could be used as, as amplifiers and disable these amplifiers. Or we need to implement better ingress and egress filtering, um, like ECP38. Or we just need to abandon UDP and switch to alternative protocols like Quick that do not allow for this to happen in the first place. And the other class of, of countermeasures basically is looking into prosecution, um, where the idea is that, OK, maybe we are not able to change the internet so much. Maybe we can instead just find the attackers and then punish them for, for their deeds. And there's a good reason to do that, because, well, the internet is really slow to adapt, mostly because there are many, many involved parties in the internet. Um, this can, for example, be clearly seen in the fact that IP version 6 has been introduced since 30 years now, somewhat like that. And the adoption rate is still very, very, very low. Um, prosecution, on the other hand, of course, has the drawback that you need to be able to attribute attacks. You need to be able to, to trace back attacks. And that's actually what I've been, been working on mostly during my, my PhD so far. And on the next few slides, I would like to, to motivate why this is an interesting and hard problem, and then how in our current paper we try to address this using BGP spooking, uh, poisoning. So if you again look at such an attack, if you look at such an attack from the perspective of the victim, we see that, OK, all the traffic the victim is receiving is coming from the amplifiers. And the victim has no direct contact with the attacker. So clearly, just looking at the attack from the victim's perspective, we will never be able to figure out where the attacker is. On the other hand, if we go over to the perspective of the amplifier, things look a little bit better because we do receive traffic from the attacker directly, but it's only with the spoof subs. So are we also out of luck here? Well, not quite. Because the interesting point here is that although the traffic is received into spoofed source, it's still originating from the attacker. And the follow-up question, of course, is like, what does this imply? What does this mean? Um, and to answer this, I need to tie it a bit closer. And for this example, I want to remove this, this cloud, because, of course, the internet is not just one cloud. The internet, instead, is basically a network of networks of autonomous systems. And what actually happens is that basically the attacker, even though he's spoofing some, some packets, he is located in some autonomous system. Like he has some infrastructure that he can send his packets from. And then these packets will traverse through some other autonomous systems until they reach our honeypot or the amplifier. So this raises the question of whether we can actually do some AS level traceback. And well, to look at this, we basically need to figure out, OK, how does the attacker actually know where to send stuff? And the answer to this is, you're probably aware of this, the border gateway protocol BGP. So basically, our honeypot will tell, OK, the honeypot or the IP of the honeypot is reachable via the AS that the honeypot is located in. And then this will be sent out text, which can then store this information and then tell its neighbors in turn, oh, by the way, if you're looking for the honeypot, you can reach this through me and then the AS1. And then these autonomous system in turn will, set, will uh, can note down the path to the honeypot system and propagate this on and on and on. And now, for example, the, the autonomous system that the attacker is located in, he receives two possible announcements for the honeypot system. One from the orange autonomous system 3 and one from the blue one AS5. 
And what happened in this case is that basically the autonomous system needs to figure out which of these is its preferred path, its best path. Um, and then in this example, I just had it choose the path via AS3. And now the, honey, uh, the attacker is able to send packets towards the honeycomb system. What it will do basically is it will look at the best next hop from, for its local system. In this case, that's the path via the orange and then AS3 now has the problem of forwarding the traffic. But again, it can look up its tables and see, okay, I need to forward this to AS2. And then AS2 finally knows, okay, I need to forward this to AS1. And now we have stuff reaching the honeypot. Now this in itself is not really helpful so far. But the question that we can now ask is, can we somehow influence the attacker? And can we influence it in such, such a way that we can actually figure out which autonomous system the attacker was placed in? And turns out in BGP, yes, you can influence others through BGP poisoning. And the idea behind this is that basically you can control the advertisement that you make for your own prefixes. Um, and this is abusing the fact that BGP is a so-called path back to routing protocol. So basically, every autonomous system does not just record the next best hop, but it records the entire path towards the destination. Um, mostly this is done for, for loop prevention, loop detection, so that you don't end up with circular paths in the internet. But actually, we can use this to our advantage by not advan uh, announcing like regular advertisements, but by injecting other ASs already in the path. So for example, we could tell, OK, the honeypot can be reached by us, and then by the orange system, and then again by us. And if AS2 now um, pro uh, processes this advertisement, it will not see any change and just say, OK, sure, that's now the route to the honeypot system. The interesting point now happens if this advertisement reaches the orange system, because the orange system is already on the path. And the orange system will now see, OK, I'm already on the path. I should not consider this advertisement. I should instead drop it. And at this point, we will call the orange system poisoned. And poisoning basically means that it now has its connection to us. It has its, its route to, to send traffic to the animal system. And even worse, of course, it now also will have to withdraw all routes it had announced to other systems that used that part. So it will have to withdraw its route to the attacker AS. And then the attacker AS, of course, has to remove this from its table and choose the other uh, route via the blue AS as the next best path. Um, and since the orange system is not on the, on the lower path, on that path, the advertisement can traverse just, just freely. And now with this poison advertisement, we basically have created this situation where the attacker now is sending its traffic still to our honeypot system, but it has to do this via AS5, 4, and 2. How is this helpful for traceback? Um, well, basically, we can look at the reactions that we can see under poisoning. And there are actually only three different reactions that we can see. Um, as we've seen before, we can cause the attacker to switch to an alternative path. This happens, for example, if we poison the, the orange system. Um, if you were to poison the green system instead, this would mean that the attacker now can receive no more path because, well, the attacker was only connected through the green system. And if we poison the green system, there's no more connection the attacker can make. So in this case, we would see a connection loss. And then finally, if we were to poison a system that is not on the original path of the attack traffic, then nothing will happen. Like we have no change. And the nice thing about these three cases is that they actually they are observable at the honeypot by just looking at the attack traffic. So switching to an alternative path, although it's not always the case, it, it can be observable at the honeypot because the path that is switched to might be of a different length, like a different IP hop count length. And therefore, the TTL values that we see at the honeypot might change. Um, the case of connection loss is quite obviously visible because then we will no longer receive traffic because the attacker cannot send us traffic. And then finally, the last case is not observable, but it's observable in the sense that we cannot make an observation. But this is already quite helpful because the 
upper two cases, they can only happen if the AS that will be poisoned was on the original traffic path. And this is already a good insight, because it means if the attack traffic changes, then the poisoned AS was on path. And that's actually already the, the first naive trace big idea that, that, that we have. It's basically, the algorithm goes like this. For every autonomous system that is, exists, you poison the autonomous system A, and if it has an effect, then you add it to your set of candidates. Sounds good. The problem, of course, is there are roughly 70,000 active autonomous systems as of now. And since BGP root convergence is a little slow, we basically need to wait for, for paths to settle before we, before we can check whether they will affect or not. Um, and we realistically cannot make advertisements at a rate much faster than six per hour or like once every 10 minutes. Um, which basically means that with this setup to poison or to, to probe the entire AS space, we would leave around 11,667 hours or roughly 486 days or roughly 1.3 years. Um, and now since I've said before that most attacks do not last longer than an hour, this of course is a problem. Um, but there are some, some things we can do about it. And the first quite obvious change is we can actually poison multiple ASs at once. So instead of just poisoning a single system, we can excuse you, send out an as, um, advertisement that poisons the orange and the blue system at once, which will lead to, to this situation. And then, of course, in this situation, we can observe some effect. And what we will do if we observe, observe split just mate and recurse. So in this example, we would then try to only poison the blue system and then only poison the orange system and see which of the two actually caused the effect. And the upside of this is actually we are only limited by the maximum AS path length that can be advertised. Um, and some previous studies have found that even with absurdly long AS paths, like 250 ASs, you still have a very, very good propagation throughout the entire internet. And this actually helps us to speed up our um, Algorithm because now instead of just going AS by AS, we can go through these ASs in blocks. Um, and then basically, we poison the entire block. If we see an effect, then we split the block into parts. Um, otherwise, we can discard the entire block. Um, for our experiments, we chose 128 ASs in parallel, so half of the maximum size that was reported in previous um, results. And then some, some slight logarithmic overhead for every time that you need to split and recurse. But since the AS paths that actually happen in, in the internet are quite short, this is not too much of an overhead. And then you end up with a estimated runtime of around 91.1 hours or 3.8 days, which is not great, but at least it's, it's feasible. And you can actually do even one step better. You can stop your search once you find a stub AS. Um, the reason for this is that basically a stub AS is an AS that has no further customers. So it does not provide transit for other systems. So if you see traffic that comes from the stub AS, then well, the stub AS must be the origin of the traffic because it doesn't have any customers that could have been the true origin. And this is nice so far. But of course, the question still remains, can we do better? Because, well, actual paths of, of B2P paths, or actual length of B2P paths in the internet are on the order of five to 10. Whereas we have roughly 70,000 active ISs. So we're basically wasting a lot of time by poisoning ISs that are not at all on the, on the path that we're interested in. Um, and what we can do there is actually Use the, the information about relationships between autonomous systems. Um, and it actually turns out that we can build a sort of rooted directed graph over all ASs, where the root is the AS with our honeypot system. And then we have an edge between two ASs only if one can advertise a route to the other towards our honeypot system. Um, so, for example, this might then look something like this. So, AS 
two on the on the left side has a connection to our Honeypot system, and then all AS's below it are are connected through AS2 and can receive a um, route through them. And how is this helpful? Well, for example, if we were to receive attack traffic from from AS2 in this case, although we don't don't know that it's it's AS2, we can use this graph to speed up the search by searching in layers. Because of course, in the first step, it doesn't make much sense to search for some AS that's far, far away. In the first step, we will really want to search AS2 or AS3, like the ones that are close to us. But more importantly, we can actually use it to prune the search. How? Well, if we were to poison AS3 in this case, we would see no effect on the attack traffic, because the attack traffic is coming from AS2, and AS2 is still connected. However, since we have poisoned AS3, we know that it no longer has a root to us. And since it no longer has a root to us, so do all its children. So in this case, we can actually prune this entire subpart of the graph. Is a case of speed up. Um, vice versa, if you were to poison AS2 and the attack traffic now stops, we can also know that, okay, since we poison AS2 and we no longer receive attack traffic, but before we did, we can actually focus on the part of the graph that is below AS2. And since we can now prune large parts of the graph, this gives us a dramatic speed up. The slight downside, of course, is that this requires accurate AS relationship data. Um, but there are some quite good approximations of this already available, for example, from, from, from Kaida. Um, so another question is, how good is this in practice? And we actually tried to build this in the real internet. So we obtained a temporary slash 22 allocation and a temporary autonomous systems number from right. And then set up four networks with our honeypots. So four slash 24 networks where on each IP address we installed our honeypot system. And then we used three of these to, to probe, like to send out poison advertisements. And the fourth one is a control prefix that was just advertised regularly. Um, connected to our local BGP speaker. And then we were also very thankful to get, were given access to the peering BTP test bed, where we were configured as a customer, so we could send advertisements to them. Um, however, we then found out that we can only send advertisements with maximum two poisons through peering. Um, they might have good reasons for, for doing that. However, in our case, it actually meant that it meant we were it was infeasible for us to perform a full run of the system. So we resorted to the next best thing, which is evaluate it in a simulator and just use the testbed to bootstrap some parameters. The simulator is a custom simulator that we've uh, written in Python, which tries to model AS relationships based on the AS rel dataset from, from Kaida. It tries to model TTL distance, distances because we need to figure out whether a path change also causes a TTL change or not. Um, and for this, we basically measured the hop counts that the path takes within an AS using the experimental setup we had before. And it also models default routes. Um, these were found in previous studies to be like one of the core influences why real world performance and simulated performance deviate a lot. Um, and it turns out that default routes are actually occurring for roughly 40% of ASs. Um, a default route means that basically an autonomous system, even though it has no explicit route given to your prefix, will still be able to send you traffic just because it has a default route that it can use. Um, and then finally, we model path convergence in our model by basically having this, this AS graph, having random weights for every link, and then using a shortest path over all those, which should model roughly the real world behavior of BGP when you take local preferences and this into account. Um, and yeah, and then in our simulator, we basically ran a lot and lots of results, and the results look somewhat like this. Um, so here you can see the 
box plots, where every box corresponds to one of the three algorithms. So naive is really the naive algorithm with already the blockwise parallelization. Naive plus is the algorithm with the early termination as soon as it finds a stub AS. And then graph is the graph-based algorithm. Um, the duration is now here given in, in steps, so in number of advertisements that need to be made. So if you want to convert this to, to hours, you need to divide by six. Um, and we can see that basically the naive algorithm performs as we were to expect from our computation before. The naive plus algorithm performs already a lot better. It's basically half the time which is to be expected because there are many, many stub ASs. And if you do a random search, you will find the stub AS on average after half of your entire search space. Um, but really importantly is the graph algorithm outperforms the others by quite a bit. So for example, 25% of all cases for the graph algorithm terminate in under four hours, which is really quite, quite impressive. Um, on the right-hand side, you also see the success rate. And success rate we defined as each of these algorithms will basically output a candidate set of autonomous systems that it thinks are on the path of the, the attack traffic. And if the true origin is among this candidate set, and if the candidate set is not larger than, say, eight, then we say the execution was successful. Um, we allow it to have a small number there because it's quite feasible to have individual correspondence with like eight AS operators. But it's definitely infeasible to do this with 70,000. Um, and you see a success rate of roughly 61% for the naive algorithms and 68% for the graph based algorithm. And looking into why the success rate is so low, it basically turns out that this is mostly due to default rules. Because if something still sent to replies, even though you think it should not, then this, of course, messes with your algorithm. Um, to prove the point, we rerun the experiments in an ideal world with a default root prevalence of zero, which is shown now at the, at the top of, of the lower graph. And in that case, well, both the number of steps go down quite, quite a bit, but also the success rate now skyrockets to 100%. Um, and on the lower point of, of, of the graph, we also tried to emulate it with a much, much worse setting, where 80% of all ASs would have a default root. Um, and well, the sort of lucky finding is that in this case, with the graph-based algorithm, you still succeed in roughly 30% of all cases. But the runtime gets much, much, much worse. <laughs> um, well, yes. So to conclude, basically, I've shown you that we have a honeypot system that sees many, many attacks with mostly five prevalent attack protocols. Um, we've seen that attack traceback is a non-trivial problem, both from the victim and the amplifier's perspective. Um, and I show, shown you how we can sort of use BGP poisoning to have a, at least an AS level traceback system. And with that, um, thanks for the invitation again, and I'm happy to take questions.